Would y'all look uh, in your Bibles to Luke 15, verse 1. Luke 15, verse 1. As usual, I have a question for you. Do you like wasps? No. And I don't mean white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. I'm talking about the red, evil, dive-bombing, angry, insect fascists <laughs> that rule the outdoors at times like this. Does anybody like wasps? Okay, good. So we can talk about them. Nobody's going to get offended. Okay. Um, I hate wasps. Um, I know that they are the top predators in the biosphere thingy in the insect world and they have a niche and all this other stuff. But I hate them. Uh, one of the coolest things that I ever did in my life was uh, I was serving another church and they had a shed. And there was a massive nesting of wasps. And it was not a wasp nest. It was a nesting, which means not nesting. Well, it was a sting, but it was, a, it was more than one nest in the shed. <coughs> okay? And I had to go in there. The lawnmower was in there. Okay? So this had to be done. So what I did was I put on, you know, those lab goggles. And I put on a half mask. And I think I had work gloves on and long sleeve shirt. This was like... Early in the morning, mid spring, and I had a can of sp wasp spray in each hand. The, the kind that shoots like 50 feet and looks like silly string. Okay, so imagine this. I'm ready to go, man. And I go in there, and it began at dawn <laughs> with a strike on their post at the front door of the ship. You know how that goes with the military. And then, I mean, eventually I was in there, I rolled in there, it was spraying the entire, I didn't get stung at all. It was awesome. It was one of the coolest things ever. It was a beautiful thing. They all died. It was amazing. Okay. Now, the thing I hate the most is their sting. But the second thing I hate the most is their buds. Because to me, it sounds like a mutter. Zoom, zoom. I was at my dad's on Friday, and I was pressure washing his deck. And every once in a while, I would hear that zoom, zoom, and the whole time, they would come up to me, and they would check on me, and they would mutter. <coughs> zoom, zoom. And one time I looked up, and one was three inches from my face, but I had the pressure washer. <laughs> I split that sucker right in half. <laughs> it was awesome. It was a beautiful thing. I hate their mutter. Now, how do you react to people who mutter? There's always a negative mutterer, isn't there? Mm -hmm. Y'all can say amen. There's one at work, isn't there? There may be five at work. There's one out in public, right? There's some on the talking head news stations, right? Okay? Uh, there's never one in church, is there? Never, 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 because we all love Jesus. All right? There's always a mutterer. And Jesus had mutterers, too. You've got the scripture today. I'm about to read it. Uh, the tax collectors and the sinners. Okay? Uh, these are those people that the moral religious people think are the worst kind of people. And they are gathering around listening to Jesus. The word of God. God in the flesh has come to them. They are not even in pews and they are definitely not sleeping. They are listening in. They are paying close attention. And then there are the mutterers. And guess who it is? It's the religious people. It's the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. So we're going to pick up on Luke 15, verse 1. I'm going to go through 1 through 3, and I'm going to skip to verse 11 and stop about verse 24. This is kind of long, so hang on. Here we go. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Okay. And then he told them this parable. Actually, he tells them three parables, but here we go. We're going to skip to verse 11 in one of the parables. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And so he divided his property between them. And not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and then squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, 
There was a severe famine in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. Keep in mind how low that is. Good Jewish boy going out to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. And when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went back to his father. But, this is huge, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, he threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Verse 21, the son said to his father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let us have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This is the word of God for the people of God and all God's people said. Jesus has the ultimate, and I mean the ultimate chance here. It is a beautiful thing. Jesus has the ultimate chance to explain to everybody what God is like. His two main audiences that he's been sent to are right in front of him. He has the spiritually lost people, and they're listening, and he has the religious people, and they're listening enough to go, okay? Both of these people are desperately in need of spiritual help unto eternal salvation even. And Jesus has the ultimate chance to explain what Jesus is like. People, the people that need to hear that message are listening, and the other people that need to hear that message are muttering against him. And I know it's so hard to believe that good religious people would mutter, but it's true. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now Jesus is the incarnation of God on earth. He has all power and authority in heaven and earth. He could have picked any image to communicate what God is like to these sinners and religious people. He could have chosen a king. He could have chosen an eagle. He could have chosen a lion. He doesn't. What does he choose? He chooses a father, but not just any father. He could have chosen an austere father who's aloof and, and forgiveness with him is just some sort of moral contract or something like that. He chooses a forgiving father. He chooses a loving, forgiving father who longs, and I mean longs, for the return of his lost child. He's sitting out there watching the road, hoping he's going to come back. And then that day, he does. It is a loving, forgiving Father. And the image is pretty clear here. There's not a lot of gray area. Now, the prodigal son represents um, any man or woman or child who is far from God. And the Father represents God Himself. And the image is clear, but the message is even clearer. It doesn't matter how far you are from God. It doesn't matter how far you are from God. You don't have to be separate from Him. You don't have to sit in the muck, and you don't have to cry that you can't go home. All you have to do is repent. To turn away from this life that has led you to destruction and back to the arms of your loving, forgiving Father. The non-religious people that Jesus was with had never really heard this before. Why? Because they had been listening to the mutterers. They had been listening to the scribes and the Pharisees who had taught them 
uh, you know, there's 50 bajillion hoops to jump through, but also that they were so dirty that they shouldn't even bother coming back home. Now, have you ever been so far from God that you felt like that you couldn't come home? Most of you probably not. I don't know. Maybe you are. Maybe I'm just misreading y'all. Okay? A lot of you have been basically weaned on this message of the prodigal son. Any distance between you and God can be overcome by repentance, confession, and basically coming home. And maybe there's something in your life, though, that you've held on to it and you need to let it go. It could be no more than a memory of something that you did while you were far from God. And that memory, memory leaves you with questions and no answers. And, 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 and folks, this, is, this image, this message is good news. This is the gospel. Any distance between you and God can be overcome, not so much by traveling by that distance, that distance, but by turning around. And anyone who messes or tinkers with that image, honestly, I think is of the devil himself. Piling legalism and burden on people who would be free from sin and death. Now, one of the scriptures that everybody needs to memorize is that one I think, you know, is, is Luke 15, 20, right in there. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he, that is the father, ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. Is that your usual image of God? It's not the world's image of God. I guarantee you that. They think God is Zeus and me and ready to hit him with lightning bolts. We're not going to be able to change that unless we memorize this, know this, and live it, breathe it, all of it. If the devil or some muttering religious person or some snarky whatever gets in your face about your past, you or their past, or whatever it is, Share this image with them and glory be to God. Because folks, it can change them. I mean, this, this image changed me. I can testify about that later. But it could change, it could be all the evangelism that you ever need. Look at them, show them this, and say, what if this is true? And let God work on it. For me, this is the overriding image of God in the scriptures. Now, I am acquainted with, um, even though we're the Facebook friends, he's not really my friend, we're acquainted with a guy named Charlie Mackesy. Uh, Charlie is basically a little weird. Uh, he is an artist who actually makes a living as an artist. Uh, and he lives in London while doing it, which is not cheap, okay? <laughs> Um, and he actually just got, um, he just reached an agreement with Penguin Publishers to publish a book of his, uh, some sketches he's been working on that have gone viral on the internet. Um, he did the chalk sketch that's on the cover of your bulletin. Uh, he was not raised in church. He was pretty much antagonistic to Christianity for most of his life. And one day he found himself arguing Christianity with an Anglican, well, he was arguing that the, the bishop wasn't. It was an Anglican bishop. They happened to be at the same party. And Charlie was in jeans and whatever, a shirt, and, and the bishop was all passacked out and everything. And so Charlie's trying to argue with this guy, and ultimately the bishop says to him very simply, Charlie, none of us is perfect, but I believe that we are perfectly loved. And shortly after that, Charlie came to faith in Christ, and he became very familiar with this image of the loving, forgiving Father. It's, it's affected his art. He has drawn hundreds, maybe even thousands of versions of the sketch that you see on the cover of your bulletin. He even had a, uh, a cast bronze statue of it. It now sits in a, in a park somewhere, but it used to sit in the narthex of his church. Uh, and everybody would remember when they passed by that statue, this is the image of God that we are communicating. Well, not long after he became a Christian, he was in a coffee shop. And the image of God that was communicated in the scripture was filling his heart. And he was giving his order to the barista. And I know it, I, I, I'm not comfortable with those Starbucks terms. You know, and grande. And I go in. If I, if I go in, I say, give me a medium. And, the, you know, they go, okay. But anyway, barista. He called it a barista. And he said he was so consumed with that image of God. And he was so fresh coming to faith in Christ. 
He said, quote, I was just consumed with love for this barista, or barista. He said, I wanted to reach over the counter and hug him. Now, I know you're not going to do that. I'm not prescribing that you do that because there's like laws and stuff now. Okay, but where do you think that love came from? And I know that some of you say, well, I could never do something like that. And I don't want you to, okay? Just don't, don't go off thinking the pastor wants us to hug everybody. You know, hug who you want to. Well, not really, but you know. Um, I have, some people will say, well, I'm too introverted and all this other stuff. I get that. I'm not making fun of you and I'm not, I'm not mocking you. But being familiar with Charlie, I assure you that if he were in this room, he would be the most introverted person in the room. And he shares the love of God through his art and through his words. And the more we set out to overcome whatever it is that limits us, that shares the love of God, the more positive change in the world there is going to be. The problem is, is it can be difficult. There's a lot of stuff that holds us back. There's culture. There's rules at work. Uh, some of us have been in countries and even detained because of rules put in place by terribly open-minded, benevolent control freaks who demand to be worshipped, but that's another sermon. <coughs> and then there's the religious people, or part of the religious people, those people that go the mutterers, just like Jesus had to deal with. It is hard, and I don't shirk from mentioning that. There are Christians who do not want the Church of Jesus Christ to grow because it is inconvenient to them. But it's hard in a million different ways. And I kind of got a story about that. And it may not sound like I'm really telling the story about this, but hang on, I'll come around to it in the end. Um, I went on a working retreat last week, and then I took a weekend off. And I went to my favorite retreat place. Alas, it is not Camp Sumatongo. That has been supplanted. That is now my number two. It is the Abbey of Gethsemane. I know it's heresy for a Methodist to say that. But I went to my favorite retreat, the Abbey of Gethsemane, which is a, a Roman Catholic Trappist monastery. Uh, and I've gone there once a year, on average, for 13 years. Uh, when I go there, it is a working retreat. I do long-term sermon preparation. It is not a vacation, but this time I took a little personal time. And um, you know, I usually get up at like 4 in the morning central and go to bed by like 8 central or whatever it is. But um, I went for this three-hour hike on Wednesday. And I went to, I, I looked at the map of the Abbey grounds. It's like 2,000 acres or something like that. I'd looked at the map for years. But I realized, I really analyzed it this time, and I realized that I had never gone to some of the cooler parts. I'd walked around and seen all the statues and stuff like that. But I decided that I was going to climb the highest knob, the highest Kentucky knob, it's in Kentucky, on the grounds of the Abbey of Gethsemane. And it's called Tent Knob. I guess people put up tents there and camp and stuff like that. 974 feet high. And as I was making the hike, I'm thinking about preaching today and preaching on the scripture. And when it began, it wasn't hard at all. It was a steady grade. Uh, there were things to see. There were trees. There was this small stone chapel that looked like it was part of Camp Sumatanga, including the repairs. And then I went up into another grade. And it went from like this to like this. Okay? And it changed. The territory changed. It got muddy in some unexpected places, which was weird. Uh, it was rocky and gravelly and leafy and slippy and uh, and sometimes I had to stop and catch my breath, which is weird because I run. But I went on. And the grade then got even steeper. And then I really started bleeding hard. And so I had to stop again, but I went on. And finally, I got to this shelf of land and I looked up and I had to do this. And there was Tent Knob. And I thought, Lord Jesus, this is impossible. There was even a sign. Hey, Charlie, could you show them the sign? You see the sign? Tent knob. Very steep. It was steep. I didn't, it was so steep, I didn't think to take a picture of the steep. 
And I was like, thank you, Captain Obvious. <laughs> but something inside me said, go on. And all I could think about was, you know, I'm not 35 anymore, and I could actually break a hip. Um, and I didn't want to die out there. <laughs> but it was a silent retreat, you know. I mean, how am I going to tell anybody? I'm hurt. Anyway, how am I going to know if I'm missing? Nobody, you know. But I, something said to me, you, you got your phone. I mean, it's, don't be legalistic about it. So I went on. And it was hard. I had to stop halfway up the summit and lean back against a tree that was having trouble hanging on itself. <laughs> And I got up to what I thought was the top, and oh crud, there was even more! <laughs> but, what was up there was at a less steep grade. So it went from this, to this, to this. And I was able to walk that last bit. And what was at the top was, um, it was about half the size of this room. And there was a half rotten little wooden bench, maybe you know the monks sat on or something. I don't know. They need to repair it. I'm not dragging the wood up there, that's for sure. And there was this um, pile of rocks that looked like had been built up over time, very small, but it looked like a little altar. And so I found a rock and I put my rock on there, and I was afraid that it wasn't going to stay, so I had to mess with it and engineer it for a bit. And then I picked up another one. <laughs> this was cool. This is like red flint or something like that. I don't know. But that, this was it. This is from the top. And I looked around, and the leaves aren't budding yet because it's Kentucky, and you can see through the trees nearly a thousand feet up. And it was perspective, and it was beautiful. And I think that's how it is sharing God's love. It's hard, and you think you can't do it anymore. But it's a beautiful thing. And it's the greatest treasure that anybody can have. And it's the greatest treasure that anybody can share. But the cool thing about it is the more you give it away, the more you have of it. And there are mutterers. And all too often they are Christian. These are hills to climb. But imagine, imagine if you don't just hold on to the love of God but if you share it, who do you know who would be changed? How would you be changed in the sharing? How much stronger would you become by pushing up the hill? How much could you speak into the mutterers themselves? Imagine the mutterers being changed. And glory to God, Holy Spirit, let it be so. And Charlie's handwriting is kind of artsy and frankly it's a little bad. Um, but on this sketch, you can see it on the cover of your bulletin. It took me, I had to like focus on it to sort of read it. Maybe you can read it better. But this is what it says. This is the story of the prodigal son. It should really be called the running father, which I think should be called the loving, forgiving father, but Charlie and I would have lots of disagreements, so moving on. It really should be called the running father who waited every day for his boy to return. The boy who had rejected him so badly and finally, when he saw him from a long way off, his father ran to him, hugged him, and kissed him. And when you spend a year with Jesus, folks, when we do that, and we do it well, sorry I didn't get the email out the last couple of weeks, I'll get back on that. When we do it well, he reveals to us the love of the Father, and this is it. Whatever your hills to climb, whatever the mutterers are going to mutter, it is a beautiful thing, it is yours, it is all that is needed to change the world, as long as we share it in word and in deed. It's all you need to change you if you receive it. And if you haven't, will you receive it now? We're going to open up the altar for just a little bit.